Well, that's the prosecution trying to give us really a look into what Jordan was doing that night. Just a young boy going to a convenience store, then going to a party. And you notice how he had a picture, a photo of Jordan to bring him to life to that jury. Now, we have with us a great prosecutor from New York City, Julie Rendleman. You're all familiar with her. Julie, what would you say about him holding that photo? Uh, you know, it's funny, like in New York, in New York, we, we may not even be allowed to do that. A lot of judges would have said that. Why is that? Because it's not necessarily relevant to anything. Um, you know, it, it's there to, in a sense, for one reason, to evoke sympathy for the victim. Um, and so there's not really any probative value to a photo of, of this young kid. Now, it's heartbreaking when you see it, but the fact that it's heartbreaking may be in ours to the benefit of the prosecutor, you know, for, for no reason other than to, to evoke that sound. Uh, well, well, you know, as we all know, that, that when you try a case, you have to have a theme. Jennifer Schuster, you are amazing. You are in Chicago, right? That's right. And you have been both a reporter covering these cases and a trial lawyer. Tell us, what did you think about that photo? Did that bring Jordan Edwards to life for the jury, and would you have done it? You know, I agree with Julie here that I think it's a bit prejudicial, so I think it's surprising that uh, the judge would allow it in this case. Um, but if the lawyer can get away with it, um, yeah, I think it's effective. It pulls at the heartstrings of the jury, and that certainly is one of the goals here. Well, you know, I was a prosecutor also, and also a defense attorney, as you all know. And of course, as a prosecutor, I would have used it, but as a defense attorney, I would have objected to it. So is there truth in a courtroom, or is it just a show? Julie. Well, I, I, you know, yeah, I, I, think I, I see you mumble and stuff. I, I think there, there's so. truth and there's a show. I mean, you know, you know, but Jen, it shouldn't be that way. Well, because this is the, it shouldn't be that way. And so the question is whether or not, you know, look, I didn't see whether or not the defense attorney objected to it. Um, and so if he did, then it's for the judge to make a determination as to its relevance. Um, I'm not sure, again, if it, I agree with you that as a prosecutor, if I was given the chance to do it, I would because prosecutors will take advantage of that. Now, keep in mind that a prosecutor always has to be aware of the possibility of an appeal. And so they want to protect their records. So they have to be careful not to go too far over the line or they're risking an appeal. I'm not sure that this goes too so, far so over Jennifer, the line. So, Jennifer, you know the benefit of interviewing somebody in person because you actually interviewed the killer in the making of the murder case, Stephen Avery. So I'm just going to like turn that a little bit. Since the jury can't interview Jordan Edwards, doesn't the prosecution showing a picture of him and talking about him take the place of it? Well, not quite, but sure, it has the effect of bringing the victim to life. Um, and that's one of the goals of the prosecutor, to make this boy um, as, as live as possible, you know, that this uh, officer took away a, a very real, valuable human life. And by showing the picture, it's probably the closest thing he can do at this point. Well, yeah, and also next he can call the stepmother of the victim, Jordan Edwards, because he is a victim. Uh, her name is Charmaine. Uh, excuse me, Charmaine Edwards, and she is also going to bring Jordan to life, we hope. So that was Charmaine Edwards, Jordan's stepmom, talking about him and him doing what kids do. He was going to be a great football player. Uh, he was good with the family. He was a terrific kid. Uh, he was, goes to parties. Now, let me ask you this, Jennifer Schuster, who's out in Chicago. Is the fact that he's a good kid relevant to whether or not the police officer had reasonable cause to fear for his life and shoot him? No, and, and that's what the defense is going to say. It may be true that Roy, or that uh, this boy, Jordan Edwards, was a great kid, that he was had lots of friends, he was going places. But the bottom line is, from Roy Oliver's perspective, there was a threat presented to his fellow officer. And well, he uh, well that, that, that leads me, Jennifer, that leads me to the question that I'm going to then toss over to Julie. Julie, then why should an officer know about whether a kid is bad? If he, They shouldn't know about whether a kid is good before a shots ring out. Well, I think, let's be clear, this case is in, you know, the case is about kind of what Roy Oliver's position and thoughts were at the time that these events happened. I think there's an argument to be made, although, I'm, again, I'm not sure it's relevant, but there's an argument to be made is that if the jury is considering the fact that this kid has no prior record, that makes it less likely that 
he is objectively a danger to Roy Oliver. However, at the end of the day, I think what's only relevant is what transpired during that 30 minutes or 15 minutes that the events took place. And that's why we have to hear about what happened at the party, what the party was like, and what Jordan was doing at the party, and who better to hear from than somebody who was there, Jeremy Seaton. So that was Jeremy Seaton. He was a friend of the decedent Jordan Edwards. They came to the party. He was at the party. And what was the party? Well, it was advertised by flyers. There were a lot of people there. There was rap music playing. Uh, this man, this young man, didn't have any drugs, didn't have any alcohol. He didn't see any drugs. He didn't see any alcohol. There's no testimony about Jordan having drugs or alcohol. And all of a sudden, the cops rise, and then everyone wants to leave. Now, what does that have to do with whether or not Jordan should have been shot? I think this gives some kind of background, which I think is relevant. I think it's important for the jury to at least understand what was transpiring prior to the police arriving. Um, and, and, and so I think it certainly gives enough for the jury to, to, so they have a better understanding of what's happening right before the events happen. So, so we just heard from Julie Rendleman, who, by the way, is, was a major, major prosecutor in New York City and now a great defense attorney. I'm going to go out to Chicago, the Midwest, and Jennifer Schuster. Now, you've been involved as a, both a reporter and as an attorney, both watching these cases, commenting on cases, and doing work as an advocate. Why do you think it's necessary for the jury to hear the background of other people, what other people were experiencing at the party? Sure. Well, it sets the scene um, when the jury's assessing exactly uh, what, how chaotic it was there that night, because surely the, the defense will be saying that, uh, listen, there were tons of kids there. There was lots of chaos, and that will be um, relevant in them assessing whether or not it was reasonable for Roy Oliver to believe that he had to use that force that he did. Well, one of the things that we're going to hear from about this case, and this is the beginning, the police arrived and what happens after the police arrived, because this is where the emotions and the events are set in motion here. And it's very important now for the jury and I'm sure the prosecutor to make sure that they are going to hear exactly what the police saw and exactly what the individuals at the party saw. So a judgment can be made. But before we do that, obviously, and we're all monitoring other trials, we have to go to a commercial break. So please stay with us. We will be back to this trial right after this message. Well, that was Roy Oliver himself talking about a road rage incident where he's the road rager. He's a police officer. And he had a fender bender with two women in a car, obviously. And then he wants to visually identify himself as a cop in his shorts and his T-shirt. And he pulls his gun. Now, how did this come in before we discuss it? It came in because the fence first saw to keep it out. And the judge said, it's out. It's not relevant. Defendant takes the stand, and the defense brings it up. And now the jury hears that he has, shall we say, possibly a quick finger to handle a gun. Uh, Jennifer, out in Chicago, Jennifer Schuster, what do you think about that decision? Uh, not a bright one. Right. We're hearing now. <laughs> well, that's, I, li I like that. It's pretty obvious. Not a bright one. Very good. <laughs> yeah, that's my astute legal analysis here. I mean, right. Now we're hearing evidence of how um, he could have been um, sort of abusing his power here. And that's the last thing we want the jury to hear about. And, and, and in abusing his power, when he said that he was off duty and his response time would be reduced, he's assuming that they're going to pull a gun, isn't he? I think he is. I think you're absolutely right. And I know that uh, we also hear from uh, the two individuals who he was in this fender bender with, um, and they certainly contribute to this theme um, that he was sort of abusing his power here um, and, you know, flaunting the fact that he was a police officer and that he uh, had the upper hand here. Julie, Julie, if you're the prosecution and it was ruled inadmissible all the time on your case to get this in, and then the defense puts him up and asks the question, like, what are you doing, sitting back? I think maybe if I smoked, I would have a cigarette, you know, or should I, should I have asked for a drink if I drank? Or should I just smile? What do you do? Uh, look, I think there's no, as far as I'm concerned, that his testimony did him in. And the fact that it came out did him in because... There was nothing worse than the jury hearing about this other incident. Now, there's a question to be asked whether the judge should have allowed in the whole thing, just because, you know, simply because one side brings it out doesn't mean mm -hmm. that that opens the door to the whole world. Um, and so, you know, one questions whether the judge 
made you know a wrong decision by allowing in everything. However, I think without that, we might be looking at a different result. Well, we have to go to break, but on the other side of the break, you must stay tuned because we are going to hear from the two women who had the gun pulled on them. What would your reaction be? I mean, if I came up with you, I mean, this is a compact with a gun. Think about it. Remember, it happens to these two women. But first, our break. You know, when you're in a courtroom, the jury hears what we hear. So we just heard that Ashley Cuevos is the sister to the driver of the car, Monique. And that we also heard there's another younger sister in the back and a three-year-old child. This is the road rage incident that Roy Oliver decided to talk about because he apparently, according to the sisters, did it. Now, what is your reaction to this, Julie Rendleman, when you have testimony to the, like the fact that Monique said she was going to take the bullet for her sister, she leaned down so that her sister wouldn't get hit? How, how could this happen? How could this be allowed in? Well, it, it, the argument is, again, it was allowed in because the defense opened the door to it. And so the question becomes, now that the defendant has testified about it, there's a question as to, to his credibility, because now you have other witnesses that disagree with his version of the events. Now, one would argue that the defense, the prosecution should have been allowed to ask the questions and been stuck with the answers of what the officer said without bringing in arguably collateral witnesses or collateral evidence, although some would argue well, it's not well, collateral. But, but they are the ones who had the guns stuck in their face. How collateral the, can they the, be? Well, the problem becomes that this case is no longer about the murder of this young boy and is now about his acts that occurred on a separate and completely different incident. And so there's no way for a jury at this point to distinguish but, one from the other. But, but, but Jennifer, Jennifer, you know, uh, you know, when Ashley testified, she said that she could not recognize the color of his shirt, but she could see the gun. And we all know from these studies, obviously, that the gun is what, what the people see that are in these incidents. So why is this now, why is this relevant to anything, even because it is a separate incident, as Julie's saying? Event because it goes to show this pattern in practice that this officer could have been engaging in, that he had a tendency uh, to flaunt the fact that he's a police officer, to abuse his power, to be trigger happy, um, or so they say. Um, and so it's relevant in that capacity. Um, and like Julie said, uh, the defense is the one that opened the door, ironically. Um, and as a result, these women get to testify. Um, and I think it's incredibly compelling when they say, you just don't forget a gun being pointed at your face. I think that will really resonate with jurors. Yeah, and, and you know you know what, let me, let me just interrupt right here. It's usually said that these other incidents are not relevant, but one of the reasons why the prosecution may have brought this case against Roy Oliver is because they knew before the public knew that this officer had something in his history that wasn't quite right. Now, if you saw a gun being pointed in your face and it was reported to you that four, four people, including a three-year-old child, could have been at risk, maybe as a prosecution you would also bring the charges and seek to have this in. But as a defense, uh, I don't know. But we can't answer that right now because we at Law & Crime Network have to go to break. Stay tuned. We will be back. So that was the lawyer for Roy Oliver in closing, advocating for his client, that his client in a police setting, not in a sterile room like we're in today, believed that there was a danger and he had a duty to shoot, not only the right, but a duty to shoot. So let me go to Jennifer Schuster, who is an incredible attorney out there in Chicago, where we just covered the Jason Van Dyke case. Does the point that the defendant make, um, the defense attorney make, that he had a right to shoot from because it's his perspective fly in the face of his partner saying that his partner did not feel threatened? Well, it certainly doesn't help that his partner says that he didn't feel like he was threatened. And I think that's why ultimately the defense felt like they needed to call Roy Oliver to testify uh, to the contrary and say, yeah, I really felt like his life yeah, was. Let me ask you this. Should there have been an objection then from the defense and said, what the partner saw is irrelevant because it's only the perspective, as we saw in the Van Dyke case, it's only the perspective of Roy Oliver that counts of whether he believes from his perspective that his partner or other people were in danger. And I don't know if the defense did in fact make that objection, but I think it is relevant and it's the defendant's 
uh, job, the defense team's job to say, um, really, though, when it comes down to it, it's Roy Oliver's perspective that matters most. And for the jury uh, to weigh that evidence. Julie? Um, What's your, what's your I, take I, on that? Never, I mean, to make to, to make a determination as to the credibility of Roy Oliver, you need another witness who's testifying in this case, who's testifying yes. that. The, yeah, but the witness is at a different location. But, right? but but that's that's a fact for the jury to consider, and the jury will consider the fact that he's at a different vantage point. But just because he's at a different vantage point doesn't mean that what he has to say is not relevant. It's also relevant to the credibility of Roy Oliver, because Roy Oliver is saying he saw it go a certain way, and the other officer is saying it didn't go that way. Okay, so obviously this is something we're not going to decide here in the studio. The ju jury is going to get it. We, though, have to go to a quick break. Stay tuned. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. A woman in Oregon who allegedly tried to snatch an eight-month-old baby from his parents at a restaurant was arrested. 50-year-old Pauline Gaines, who authorities say was having a mental breakdown, believed the infant was her own and tried to take custody of the child at a Sherry's restaurant in Oregon City before police arrived. The child was unharmed during the incident, and Gaines now faces one count of attempted kidnapping. A convicted felon in Kansas City was arrested for a shooting spree that left three people dead and two injured. 35-year-old Isaac Fisher reportedly killed his first victim, 34-year-old Anjanetti Hollins, at her home before shooting three relatives at another home 30 minutes later, including a four-year-old girl. Fisher then reportedly fatally shot his cousin before being apprehended by authorities. Fisher now faces 18 felony counts, including three counts of murder. A second melee in less than a week at a Bronx juvenile detention center left 16 correction officers injured. The brawl occurred at the Horizon Juvenile Center in the Bronx, which opened last week under New York State's Raise the Age Law, which requires all 16 and 17-year-old inmates to be removed from prison populations in the state and placed into juvenile centers. Just days after opening, a melee ensued with officers and inmates, leaving 20 officers injured. Authorities say none of the officers' injuries were serious. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. Wow. Good police work got the spree shooter stopped in Kansas. Uh, the woman in Oregon was stopped from kidnapping a four-year-old baby. Uh, great police work there. And then we come to New York City, where just recently we have moved juveniles to juvenile facilities so they're not at Rikers Island with adults who have uh, terrible charges against them and some have terrible records. Now, Julie, how do you prevent or make these juvenile facilities better? Because they're supposed to be helping the juvenile. Instead, we have fights breaking out. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, look, unfortunately, we have juveniles that even at a young age are fairly out of control. And so the issue becomes how do you balance the fact that they're children and protecting the correction officers and the and the individuals that work at the facility. And so there needs to be a balance. And the balance needs to be there have to be more restrictions in order to protect, by the way, not only the correction officers and staff, but to protect the, the young men themselves who are going to potentially fight amongst each other as well. And, and, and Jennifer, Jennifer, uh, in Chicago, do you find that there's juveniles that are incarcerated who are in gangs? Is that part of the problem? Sure. I mean, we've got offenders who are transferred to these juvenile detection detention centers um, who have very real problems. Um, and a lot of times these detention centers aren't adequately equipped with the proper number of correctional officers, uh, with the resources to deal with the problems uh, that these offenders have. So how, how do we make this better? Quickly, how do you make this better in five words or less? Good question. Lots of five uh, words. It's name that tune here. Time on law and more crime. resources. More resources, Julie. I agree. More resources, and it, there, there has to be some better control. Okay. So we're going to continue to watch now that we've discussed that because it is an important topic of how you deal with this. You don't want to put juveniles in a facility and then have them fight, uh, and it kind of uh, defeats the whole purpose. But we're going to go back to the case we have been following all day here on Law & Crime. That's the Roy Oliver trial in Texas. A police officer is on trial for the murder of 15-year-old Jordan Edwards, and we have something in this case that sometimes we didn't have years ago. That is the body cam footage of the police officer where you either see part of the shooting, and if you can't see it, you certainly can hear it. So Julie Rendelman, prosecutor, terrific 
a terrific prosecutor. I'm just going to call you all the great words. You know, when I was in New Jersey, uh, and I was a prosecutor there, then a defense attorney, I had a case in the 1990s that actually caused all this to happen, these body cams. It was uh, four young minority men who were shot in the New Jersey Turnpike, and, um, and it created a big stir as to who was telling the truth. But as a result of that, uh, body cams came out, and cameras in the, in the police cars came out, and that was the case that started all across the country. Now, in many times, it helps the police officer. Did it help Roy Oliver here to have this body camera film of the shooting and obviously the mayhem and uh, the screaming? I, I think in certain ways it helps, in certain ways it hurts. It helps because you, you definitely see the mayhem. And even the fact that he's running and screaming, there seems to be something chaotic about it, which indicates you know, some level of a lack of control or not knowing what's going on, which inures to his benefit. I think the problem for him is the ability to be able to see the vehicle in, in, in front of him. And so the jury then gets their own perspective as to whether they believe that the, the vehicle is actually going to be veering towards the other officer or not. And so the minute you allow the jury to have their own perspective, it may very bit well be different as it is here than the perspective of the actual individual on trial. But, but Jennifer, there's been an argument made, and we saw it also made in the Van Dyke trial last week in, in Chicago, where you are, that the camera doesn't show everything. It doesn't show the actual, real, really what the officer sees. It really doesn't pick that, the detail up that a trained officer can see, and it certainly doesn't pick up what's in the officer's head, what he believes, which may be reasonable about whether a life is in danger. What do you say to that? I think that's a reasonable argument, and that's part of the reason why the defense made the decision to have Roy Oliver testify, because they're saying, listen, this body cam video doesn't pick up everything. You have to stand in the shoes of Roy Oliver, and he can tell you what he saw and what he felt in that moment. And to him, it was a reasonable belief that his fellow officer's life was in danger. Well, well, let me ask you this, or both of you. If the prosecution is successful in proving a murder case here, are there issues on appeal because of the road rage incident? I think there are. Of course there are. Again, I think, as I've said before, I think that had this road rage incident not come in, the entirety of it, with, with victims who are crying on the stand about another confrontation with Roy, uh, with Roy Oliver, I don't know that you'd have a conviction here. And that becomes a huge issue for appeal because but, now you've introduced evidence of an uncharged crime um, but, against but, him in but let, me, let me just but, take but, this. <laughs> but, 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 let me argue the other side. So, uh, of course, everything is an appeal issue. But, Jennifer, is it a reasonable appeal issue? Is it a winnable appeal issue once he took the stand? Or does it affect the appellate court saying, hey, we've got a crazy lunatic cop here. Good thing that this came out. Yeah, well, I think it was a misstep, obviously, on the defense's part that they allowed it to come in. So that's a major problem. It wasn't the judge here who ruled that it was admissible. It was the defendant's uh, own lawyer who opened the door. I do think that the conviction of what would have happened regardless of this testimony, I think that body cam video um, was incredibly damaging. You see that car pulling away very slowly, several seconds of that. Uh, so I think the conviction would have happened no matter what. And um, even if there were an appeal, they still would have um, faced the same challenges just because of that body cam video. Okay, so we're now going to see more of the prosecution's opening. Let's see who's right. Jennifer, this prosecutor is pretty imposing. What say you? I think so. I mean, the prosecution has presented a lot of compelling evidence. We've got the officer, the a fellow officer who says, hey, I, I didn't think my life was in danger. We've got the body cam video. We've got the expert that says... Um, it wasn't reasonable for Roy Oliver to act the way he, the way he did. Um, I think the prosecution is on its way to conviction. Ken, Ken, let me ask you this, and let me go into Julie. Can the defense show reasonable doubt? Can the defense inject that here, reasonable doubt? Well, remember, it's the prosecutor's burden, so you know I'm not sure that they're required to, uh, yeah, be, to I, put in I, reasonable doubt. And that's I, why I asked you this, because it always is the prosecutor's burden. But really, when it comes down to it, I believe that the defense has to inject it. See, this is one of the things I do disagree with Jennifer. With all due respect, Jennifer, is I don't believe there'd be a conviction without the other testimony, because I believe that there was some level of reasonable doubt. You know, experts testify all the time. I understand that the, the, the expert testimony is that it wasn't reasonable for him to have fired. But a jury could have viewed this and said, he 
he didn't, they didn't, the car didn't listen to the commands of stopping the vehicle. And so it, there is an argument to be made, and there's an argument to be made that this didn't rise to the level of murder, that it might have been a lesser charge. So, you know, I think there was room for it. I think that the other act made it impossible for the jury to find him guilty of anything lesser. So as you say, we disagree here. So it's very interesting because when we're having these discussions and you're having the discussions in the chat room, which one day I'll get on, okay, uh, when I'm hosting the show, um, it's, it's what people will be talking about in the jury room, um, okay? So think about it. But anyhow, something is really exciting happening today on Law and Crime. We are debuting a new show, and the show is called The Daily Debrief. It's going to summarize the best stories of law and crime today. And guess who's hosting it? Aaron Keller. I mean, you cannot miss Aaron Keller at the end of the day because he's going to make your day fabulous. After you've heard all about this blood and guts and gore, he's going to sum it up in a way that everybody is happy. So that was part of the prosecution opening in the trial of Roy Oliver, a police officer in Texas, for the murder of 15-year-old Jordan Edwards, where he's talking about his themes that he is going to prove. And if you notice, he said a couple of them, that there was no danger to the police, that no reasonable officer would have fired. And he goes on and talks about the fact that the police were there because of some person named Tupac who fired 12 shots someplace else. Now. When the prosecution does this, Julie, and opens up like this and gives the poli uh, police the reason to be there with the other 12 shots, why did somehow this trial morph into a killing of Jordan Edwards? How did this happen in the real world? Well, it happens all the time in the real world. Um, you know, it does. It well, just, that's horrifying, it, it, isn't it? It is, and I think it's. I think the thing that people are most disconcerted about is that it's rare that it comes to trial because it's rare that an officer is held criminally responsible for his acts. Um, and so this is kind of a unique situation and hopefully won't be always unique in the future. Um, at the end of the day, the real question, though, is whether or not he did, in fact, commit a crime versus kind of, I hate to say, as a police officer, made a mistake in terms of his interpretation of what was transpiring. Obviously, you know, uh, it's for a jury to make that determination. Mm -hmm. Well, Julie brings up a good point, Jennifer, that you seldom have police officers on trial for the murder for killing. And here we've had two in law and crime in two weeks that we're now seeing. Last week we saw Jason Van Dyke. This we're seeing Roy Oliver. Um, why do you think all of a sudden prosecutors are bringing cases for the killing of young men by police? Well, I think that's a much uh, bigger issue in this well, country. But it's an important issue, isn't it? Sure. Well, we certainly have seen a shift culturally um, in the past 10 years. I mean, starting, I'd say, um, in, in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, there certainly has been this, this trend um, in, in these, at least the public, um, the publicity surrounding these incidents where we've got a white officer and a black victim. So it's a, certainly a, a polarizing and controversial issue. Um, and in many cases, uh, public outcry has brought uh, these issues to the forefront. And, and, and shouldn't it be that it doesn't matter whether there's public outcry or not? Shouldn't it be whether or not it's a good shoot or a bad shoot and the, both the police can inform the prosecutor and the prosecutor can bring the case, whether or not there's public outcry? Why does that have to be the determining factor? Well, I think, you know, that's the society we live in, highly politicized, uh, polarized society. Um, but you're right, when it comes down to the actual trial, um, and whether or not the officer is found guilty, sure, it's the evidence uh, that the jury should be assessing and the credibility of the witnesses. Does the age of the victim, Julie, make a difference in whether the prosecution exercises its discretion to bring charges? Well, I, I mean, it shouldn't, um, but does it? I mean, inevitably, I think it does. Um, but we know. saw two cases. Last week it was a 17-year-old. Yeah, Here's a 15-year-old. Yeah, well. Sure. Uh, do, do you think it matters? Of you course think it, it matters does. to the jury? I, of course it does. I mean, especially keep in mind, think about the picture that we talked about initially that the jury's seeing of a young kid who everyone knows had these dreams of becoming a man. And so obviously that's going to resonate with the jury. Um, not to say that it won't if it's, an, if it's an elderly or an adult, but certainly a young uh, teenager is going to resonate and, much and more. And Jennifer, does it matter then whether or not the victim is pure and innocent? And, and you know in Jordan Edwards he was doing nothing. We know in, in the Chicago case uh, that we just finished trying uh, that Laquan McDonald was was actually holding a, a knife and had been high on PCP does it matter it matters in the sense that it makes it less likely that Jordan Edwards would have been engaging in conduct that would have presented a threat to Roy Oliver 
But really, but is that the I question? Because couldn't his friends have engaged in conduct and he just gets shot? Sure. And, and to that point, I would say that what matters most is what Roy Oliver perceived and whether or not he reasonably perceived that there was a threat in that moment. And, and can you perceive something differently at nighttime versus the daytime? you think? Well, of course. And I think that in watching the video ourselves, there's hard, you know, it's hard to see many of the things that that occurred. So it, it's not clear to us. By the way, it's it, perception even in the daytime can be different when you're looking at it from a video versus, versus if you're live and watching it yourself. And how do these standards then, Jennifer, change? How do they change? I, I, I Explain to the public who may not understand why you have one officer on trial someplace else and one officer who's not on trial in another state. I'm sorry, Linda, what was the question? Yeah, explain to the public why sometimes you can have one officer on trial in, in Chicago, but you may come to a state, another state, an un, unnamed state Z, and that officer is not on trial. Explain how that happens. You've got different standards, you know, as unfair as that may seem to be, as unfair as that may seem, you've got different standards, you know, sometimes from different county to county, um, different prosecutorial um, tendencies and patterns. Um, and so I think you'll see sometimes um, jurors in some states are more um, in favor of police officers. They'll give more deference. Um, and that's just the world we live in. Okay. So while we ponder this and while the audience ponders this and the listeners ponders, because these are very significant questions, and while I fix my earpiece, we're going to a break. You know, so that's Officer Roy Oliver, who seems to be doing a very good job on the stand. He's even keeled. He's giving an account as to what happened. Nothing major seems to be going on. He sees some kids in the house. I mean, he's got his lights on. And then we haven't even heard about any escalation. So my question to you, Jennifer, uh, who is in, 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 in Chicago, where, where uh, how soon we forget the Jason Van Dyke trial last week. Um, in that case, when the officer arrived on the scene, there was already a lot of commotion, and there had been reports that uh, the victim there slashed a tire and threatened people with a knife. Here, there's no such thing. We don't see any of that with this officer. So how does it all of a sudden become something that ends up with a young man dead? Well, I think we'll hear shortly uh, that there were shots that were fired eventually. So. Uh, the scene quickly changed um, upon those shots being fired, and that uh, resulted in a lot of additional chaos, hundreds of kids running around, uh, fleeing from this house, the boys in the car taking off in the vehicle. Um, so, yeah, within a matter of seconds, things changed tremendously. So, so Jennifer Schuster, when you were listening to the Van Dyke trial compared to listening to Oliver, did you see any differences in their temperament, the two officers, as they're testifying? I think there was actually pretty similar temperament, and it's always a challenge when the defendant takes the stand um, what type of temperament uh, to assume, um, because you don't know how it will resonate with jurors. But I think it's similar in the sense that he's relatively matter-of-fact um, and to the point. And, and Julie, you're watching him now, right? There's, there's no hint that he's going to explode, correct? Well, I don't think that there's an indication that he exploded. I mean, keep in mind, I don't think he, it, there's no evidence whatsoever that he went there with the intent to hurt or kill anybody. In fact, they went there to kind of break up this party. There was no indication that there were going to be shots fired. When shots were fired, we understand eventually that they weren't fired there, but at least from the vantage point of police officers, they hear the shots fired. Things change, and officers, you know, in terms of, you know, you know, defending them, have to change in terms of their perception of what's going on, because they're not only there to protect themselves, but they have to protect those people but, but there. Let me, let me challenge you. There is, but we've seen this officer explode. We heard about his explosion on a road rage incident. I, so. I, I agree with you, which is exactly why I don't think it should have come in, uh, because I don't know. It, there's not you know, Jennifer said it best. It's there to kind of indicate that he's done it before, which is the exact reason why it shouldn't come in, because a jury should be deciding this based on this. And unless there's some basis under Molino to allow it to come in, it shouldn't. And that's, now, a, case, again, that's a case that says what? That Let's basically see. says you can only allow in prior uncharged bad acts if there is a specific reason that is acceptable under the law. I don't see it in this case, except for the fact that he foolishly... 
brought it in himself. Okay, so we are going to talk about next the great new show that's going to debut on this network, Law and Crime Network, and you will get to see it today, 5.30. Aaron Keller will be hosting it. It's going to call, be called The Daily Debrief. It's going to talk about all the cases that we are discussing on this network. You can only get it here. You can only see Aaron here. He is the best dressed of, of certainly him and put me and me together. He beats me out. There's no doubt about it. But his, his content is even better. Stay tuned. Jennifer, we are listening to Roy Oliver, and I'm going to play Law and Crime in five notes again. Did this testimony help Roy Oliver when he's talking about the ability to ID, locate, and take out somebody who's a shooter? Uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, Why? It portrays him as somebody who's um, aggressive um, and somebody who um, is sort of abusing his power. I mean, to take out a, 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 a perpetrator or a potential offender, I mean, is, is too aggressive of language to use on the stand. And Julie? I agree, and I think that, you know, he tended to do that throughout. He was calm, but he tended to use those, like, police ease that don't bode well, especially with a typical jury. And, and, yes, when you have a client and you're going to put a client on the stand, you have to make sure that they are jury-friendly. And both uh, Julie, who's tried many cases, and Jennifer knows this from trying cases also, they have to be prepped. And when you say prepped, it's not that you're putting words in their mouth, but you want to make sure they understand that they can use the word car, not vehicle, but they can use the word, you know, they don't have to use the word neutralize. They can say stop, uh, you know, and try to avoid any further danger. That They can use friendlier terms in terms it sounds like they're coming in as the Terminator with sunglasses and guns blasting, and, and that gives an effect and it gives a picture in the jury's mind. That's what you want to avoid if you're putting your witness on the stand. So we're going to continue to discuss the Roy Oliver case when we come back, because there's just so many issues, social issues, uh, every issues that concern everybody. But first, we have to take a break, uh, because we need to have our sponsors. Welcome back, and I'm sorry to say that I have to say goodbye to my two fabulous guests today, uh, Julie Rendelman, prosecutor extraordinaire, now defense attorney extraordinaire for your insights, who's here in New York, and also Je Jennifer Schuster, who's in Chicago. Jennifer, I still didn't get to ask you questions about your interview with Stephen Avery, but hopefully we can do it next time. But thank Absolutely. you both for being here. Uh, your insights are just wonderful, and we couldn't do without you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Bye-bye.